Yo, what's up YouTube? It is time for another reaction video today with an innocent American. Uh, before we get into that though, I just want to do a shout out and thank you guys for all the comments, likes, and subscribing that you guys have been doing. It has been just amazing to see. Uh, definitely giving me motivation to keep making, making these types of videos. I just wanted to thank you guys. Now the reason why I chose to do this video is because I did make a kind of offhand comment, which I probably should not have made in a previous video. Uh, kind of saying, kind of saying that uh, Britain had started started the slave trade to uh, America. Obviously, I have come to find out that that is actually not true. Uh, so I do apologize, and I'm going to watch this video to learn exactly what they did to end it. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to doing that. I got quite a few um, pretty negative comments, and so I, I did learn. That I was wrong, which I'm fine with admitting. Uh, again, this this channel is really just all about uh, learning new things and interacting with you guys. So I I'm, I I'm, I have no problem admitting that I was wrong. But yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get into this video today and learn exactly what England or sorry, what Britain did to end the slave trade. So with that being said, this video that I chose it didn't have the a ton of views on it, but the comments were really positive. So that's why I started with this one. I actually had started making this video. I got, it's about a 23 minute video that the guy, that the channel Sargon of Akid did. Anyway, as I was doing the video, I ended up almost having a 50 minute video already. Or about halfway, I made it about halfway through and I already had 30 minutes. I was just like, this is too long of a video for you guys. I mean, it would be like a 50 minute video. So I'm actually going to start it where he starts talking about how England actually ended the slave trade, which is about 11 and a half minutes in. I will post a link below of the actual video. Uh, I definitely recommend watching it, it's really good. It, he really just talks about kind of the leading up to the slave trade. He talks about like how the Africans were enslaving um, other Africans. He talks about the Arab slave trade. He talked about the Portugal, or not Portugal, he talked about the Portuguese starting the slave trade to America. He just kind of leads up to uh, Britain ending it. So with that being said, uh, again, I will post the video or post the link to the video. And I definitely recommend watching it. I actually did watch it up to where I'm going to start this video now. Again, I just didn't want a 50 minute long video. That just seemed a little too long. Uh, we're gonna get into it right now and see what Britain did to end slavery in the world for the first time ever. Gazo, to give up the slave trade. Well, we need to turn back the clock to 1066 and the Battle of Hastings, when a French speaking Duke of Viking descent called William the Bastard, defeated King Harold Godwinson of England. William the Bastard was refashioned as William the Conqueror and took the crown of England. And one of the th first things he did as King of England was to have the entire country inventoried. This record was known as the Doomsday Book, and we still have it. Thanks to this hard work, we know that around 1086, 10% of the recorded population of England were slaves. Twenty years earlier, when he had first conquered England, William had enacted a series of laws, one of which prohibited the slave trade out of England. I prohibit the sale of a man by another outside of the country on pain of a fine paid in full to me. We don't know what William's motivation for making this law was, but given that the punishment for breaking it was a fine, I doubt it was for humanitarian reasons. Whatever his reasons, within a generation of 1086, slavery had almost died out in England. Presumably because William the Conqueror had outlawed the trade of slaves. There appears to also- Yeah, so, yeah, I had totally no idea that it was that early. I mean, that's, I mean, granted the guy did it for, mon well, apparently mostly monetary reasons, but, I mean, shoot, like, why not? I mean, I mean, I just, you can't hate, I can't hate- like the reason, yeah, he was benefiting from slavery, I guess, in a way, uh, if people were wanting to break the law and continue it, but at the same time, he pretty much was ending it. So, I mean, that definitely still had an excellent outcome. So have been a trend for lords to endow their slaves to perform their plowing functions as free plowmen. While not a wonderful state of affairs, serfdom is better than chattel slavery. And this state of affairs was solidified by the church at the Synod of Westminster in 1102, where the church denounced simony, clerical marriages, and slavery. This made England a very unique case. 
there probably wasn't another country in the world at this time that had outlawed slavery. There were practically no motivations to do so. It was incredibly lucrative, endemic to the point of normalcy, so it wasn't even viewed as immoral. And the chances are William the Conqueror himself made the slave trade in England illegal just so he could make a quick buck. Fast forward 700 years and the international transatlantic slave trade is in full swing. And yet we still do not have slaves in England. And this is where we meet a man named Granville Sharp, a very well-educated rationalist thinker of the Enlightenment, who became an active campaigner for the abolition of the slave trade. Granville had had hmm. previous... So yeah, I do see that he's using Wikipedia. Um, so hopefully most of this stuff is accurate. Like I said in the comments, uh, most people are having pretty positive reviews to this. Hopefully it's true. I feel like most of it probably is. Legal success defending Jonathan Strong from his erstwhile slave master after being brought to England from the colonies. But we're going to look at the subsequent Somerset case. James Somerset was a slave from Virginia in America, who had come to England with his master Charles Stuart in 1769, and had run away in October 1771. After evading slave hunters employed by Stuart for 56 days, Somerset had been caught, put onto the slave ship Anne and Mary, to be taken to Jamaica and sold. Three Londoners had applied to Lord Mansfield for a writ of habeas corpus, which had been granted, with Somerset having to appear at a hearing on the 24th of January in 1772. Members of the public responded to the plight by sending money to pay for his lawyers, who in any event gave their services pro bono publico, while Stuart's costs were met by the West Indian planters and merchants. Given his prior legal experience with the Jonathan Strong case, Sharp briefed Somerset's lawyers. The judgment was delivered on the 22nd of June 1772, and it was a clear victory for Somerset, Sharp, and the lawyers who had acted for Somerset. Mansfeld acknowledged that English law did not allow slavery, and only a new act of Parliament could bring it into legality. The verdict established one thing very clearly. A slave becomes free the moment he sets foot on English soil. And this was, according to Lord Mansfield, that the air of England is too pure for any slave to breathe. No matter what reason William the Conqueror outlawed slavery for, by the time this judgment was drawn by Lord Mansfield, it had become a point of principle. This precedent wasn't set for Mansfield's personal interests. This precedent was set to determine right from wrong. Granville Sharp went on to co-found the <laughs> Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade, with fellow like-minded Enlightenment thinkers. And after 20 long years of campaigning in Parliament, which I won't detail here, they were successful in their goal of abolishing the international slave trade in 1807. Now, if That's awesome. I mean, just the fact that there were cases and that there was a precedent so early in history, I had no idea. Like, I knew, I'd heard that I think uh, that uh, Britain had outlawed slavery like in like he says, 1807 or 1806. But I had no idea that there was a precedent way back, like in 10, 10 I think 10 or 1100, he said. And then there was an actual court case in 1760. That is, that is just awesome to see that like Britain was so against slavery and adamant. I, I, I just had no idea that th that was the case. Like I knew they had outlawed it, but I guess for some reason, I just hadn't really thought of what led up to that. I just, yeah, it's just crazy. Like I had no idea and just like, like they were fighting and just totally against it for so long. If you know anything about 1807, you'll know that this was during the War of the Fourth Coalition, where Napoleon Bonaparte was savaging great powers all across the European continent. The Napoleonic Wars led to new territorial acquisitions for Britain, and helped stuff Parliament with more abolitionists than they had before, which is why the bill providing for the abolition of the slave trade to conquered territories triumphantly passed in both houses. And the following year, this was superseded by a stronger measure that outlawed the British Atlantic slave trade altogether. Okay, right, so, oh, that's that's awesome. Like, so while here in America, we were arguing about allowing slavery into the new territories that we acquired, you guys were arguing to abolish slavery, make sure that slavery stayed out of the territories you guys acquired. I mean, that that is awesome. That's definitely something to be proud of. Britain's part, not not the America fighting over to keep it or not, that's kind of a, that's the black part of our history. But, given the raging war in Europe, 
it was rather difficult to enforce due to a paucity of available resources. After 1807, the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade, having achieved its goals, became the African Institution, whose principal aim was to ensure the new legislation was enforced and that other countries followed Britain's example. Persuading other countries to join Britain outlawing the slave trade proved more difficult. Despite the efforts of the African institution and those of British ministers, the Congresses of Paris and Vienna in 1814 and 1815 both failed to reach a specific agreement. Given that this was at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, it's hardly surprising that there was French opposition. Where diplomacy had failed, the Royal Navy had to succeed. It's one thing declaring a writ that people may no longer profit from the trading of human beings, it's another thing to enforce that. Enter the West African Squadron. The West Africa Squadron was a detachment of the Royal Navy that was given the task of blockading Africa, the continent, wow. to make sure that slave traders were not taking slaves to the Americas. Needless to say, in 1807, there was only a token force performing this operation comprising of two ships. Mm. This number was increased to five ships until the War of 1812 with the United States. But after 1815, with Britain victorious in Europe and supreme at sea, the Royal Navy turned its attention back to the challenge. The institute. I mean, yeah, that, that makes sense. Like, you can only afford to send so many ships, even for this um, very just cause, but you still have to protect your own country and... Then you go to war with uh, America and you, you just fought a war with France and stuff. So it totally makes sense why they didn't. I mean, you, know, you can't just send the whole Navy down to one area, sadly. But just doing anything is just awesome. I had no idea that they did this type of stuff. Now, I'm assuming when there were only two boats there, two ships, sorry. I'm assuming that there were probably still, there was probably still a good amount of slave trading going on, just sneaking them out a little bit better or something. I'm not for sure. But I mean, I had no idea that, like, that was going on. So. I mean, kudos, kudos to you guys, that's awesome. The institution of slavery was formally abolished in the British Empire in 1833. And by the 1850s, around 25 vessels and 2,000 officers and men were on the station, supported by nearly 1,000 crewmen. Experienced fishermen recruited as sailors from what is now the coast of modern Liberia. It's worth noting that this was not a pleasant job, and the mortality rate was five times higher for f compared with fleets in the Mediterranean or in home waters. To help incentivize the crew, money was actually- Yeah, I think, I think there's, uh, there was malaria going on. I don't know if that's what he's re referencing, but I'm pretty sure if I remember that not only was malaria pretty common back then, but there was in definitely like hot areas, it was pretty rampant. So that, that's probably what they're talking about. Actually given to each crew per slave that they freed. But there was a real zeitgeist in Britain for the abolition of slavery. For example, the pursuit and capture of slave ships became celebrated naval engagements, widely reported back in peacetime Britain. They became a source of national pride. So it's no wonder that many of the crews really did have an evangelical zeal about the anti-slavery patrolling. However, I don't want to give the impression that this was all for humanitarian reasons. There's no doubt that Britain, in her foreign policy... No, no. Let's just leave it. It was, it was all for hum humanitarian reasons. But still, that is just awesome. Like, setting aside, like, a squadron and designating that to just fight slavery. And also, like, the men willing to risk their lives. Because, like he said, it was, like, five times more likely to die. I mean, that's, that, that's bravery. For sure. I'm just, I'm just awed by this. Like, I had no idea used her anti-slavery laws as a stick with which to beat her opponents, primarily the Spaniards and the Portuguese, who refused to conform to these demands. Britain demanded Spain, Portugal and the very new nation of Brazil to declare slave trading to be piracy. And while these nations paid lip service to these principles, they failed to enforce them, which led to a British blockade of Brazil by 1850 which, of course, forced the nascent Brazilian Empire to capitulate. And it didn't end there. In the 1860s, David Livingstone reports of Arab atrocities against enslaved Africans stirred up the interest of the British public, reviving the flagging abolitionist movement. Throughout the 1870s, the Navy attempted to suppress this abominable eastern trade at Zanzibar in particular. Needless to say, the British Navy continued their mission against the slavers across the Indian Ocean. The abolition of slavery became the British project. 
it captured the hearts and minds of the entire country, from the highest lord to the lowest peasant. This is certainly how the British saw it. For example, Mm. this spirit of chivalry, we see it in acts of heroism by land and sea in fights against the slave trade. Alfred Tennyson, the unweary, unostentatious, and inglorious crusade of England against slavery may probably be regarded as among the three or four perfectly virtuous pages comprised in the history of nations. William Leckie. I mean, oh, that's a great place to pause. Yeah, I just had no idea. Like, I mean, that's definitely someone who's just super proud. Of, like, like, if I was British, I would, I would be really super proud of that. Like, that's, that's a huge accomplishment. Like, especially with history. I don't know too far back, but like even Roman times... Like, even over a thousand years ago, there's always been slavery. And I will say that there is still slavery today. But literally, to take such a strong stance and fight and spend money, like, yeah, no other nation was doing that. And to literally, like, rise up and be like, hey, no, we're not in this. I mean, you guys are awesome. I really don't understand why this isn't taught more. All of this was done against the vested financial interests exactly. of hundreds of thousands of people. Entire nations were against the idea of abolishing slavery and the slave trade. The very notion was alien to the human existence until Britain made it happen. In the 19th century, if you saw a ship bearing down on you, (laughs) flying this flag, and you were a slave trader, you knew that this flag stood for liberty. This was the flag of a nation the defied human convention for a man I, th- that's so badass like seriously just like like that's like stories where you read about like if you see a pirate ship or, like you, like the i think i've read stories like the uh union jack was like british fought against pirates a lot too and it was kind of a similar situation but that's just so badass congratulations guys that's awesome a point of principle and spent its blood sweat Tears and treasure to enforce it on the world. This is the flag of the nation that accepted the absolute moral truth that slavery is wrong. No matter what riches can be amassed, no matter what power can be gained, no matter the cost, slavery had to be abolished. That was the British Crusade. When Britain held the reins of world power, that is what she did with it. So, Frankie, to be honest with you, when you say we have streets named after slave owners, we have profited from a vile crime and feel no shame, it is British people that don't learn languages or British history. Britain is the true scrounger, the true criminal. That's a rough comment. (laughs) I have to concur. Yeah, I never thought that. British people apparently do not learn British history because... Okay, on that comment, I can't. Uh, yeah, I have no idea what you guys learn exactly. So I think this guy's British, so take it up with him, maybe. Britain's involvement in the slave trade is one of the most proud moments any nation could have had in their history. Okay, so yeah, he made this video in response to this writer. Um, again, this video is like five years old, and I will post a link um, for the whole video below. But um, I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, I can definitely see why um, you, you guys had some strong words for me for uh, insinuating that. Really sorry that I um, said that, because, yeah, I, I had no idea that, like how much you guys had gone out of the way to end slavery. And you, I mean, the fact that you guys came up with the idea, like, we're just going to end slavery. That's, I mean, that's incredible. Seriously, guys, I just I'm kind of just lost for words. Um, yeah, so I think that's the video. Um, I just again I made this just to kind of learn, and I definitely did. And with that being said, I think that's all I have for today. Uh, if you guys made it this far, just let let me know what you think. Like and subscribe, and uh, maybe I'll be wild more with future history. I mean, I'm sure I will be. So with that being said, see you guys later, and thanks for all the love and support.